this talk. Hope you've been enjoying the conference so far. It's my first time in GopherCon, so I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> so I'm Iska. It's a difficult name for all languages, but it is the Hebrew equivalent of Jessica, if that helps anyone. Um, and when I'm not in GopherCon, I'm a software developer at Armo. And I want to talk to you today about how we cut our memory usage by 80%, and hopefully you can as well. So when I say we, uh, I'm talking about we at Armo. We are the uh, creators and maintainers of Cubescape, uh, which is an open source Kubernetes security platform. Um, it's also a CNCF sandbox project, and like Kubernetes itself, is written in Golang. And what it offers is a single pane of glass into your Kubernetes cluster um, situation in terms of security and compliance. So we've got risk analysis and compliance. We've got your image vulnerabilities. Now, very recently, with the ability to filter by relevancy, by the actual relevant vulnerabilities. And we've got an Arbuck investigator. So recently, we've been taking some steps uh, in order to reduce our memory usage. We've had some problems with that. And we, through this process, we've learned a few things that I'd like to share with you. I think these are some practical tips that we can all use. Some of them may seem a bit basic for people who have been programming in Golang for a while, but still, I've found them very interesting. And they can have a big impact if we use them correctly. So what we'll talk about is, first of all, why is it important to optimize our code? Why are we even investing time in doing this? Um, some of the challenges of memory optimizations in particular. Uh, just a quick brief about a Golang memory model, and then we'll get to our practical tips. So why is it important? Why do we want to optimize, optimize our code? So first of all, scalability. We're writing an application. We're not writing it, running it at home on our laptop. right? We want many users to run it. We want it to be able to run on many environments, on large environments. Um, we want it to be reliable in all these environments. We want it to run well, smoothly, without any unexpected behaviors, without any errors in general, and for sure not out of memory errors. Uh, we want to reduce costs. Uh, especially today in our cloud era, we're paying for what we use. So we don't want to use a lot of memory. We want to reduce our costs. And we want to have good user experience. We don't want our users to be frustrated. We don't want them to churn. We want them to stay. And we want them to be happy. Happy users, happy life. Did we just coin a new, a new saying? Uh, so what are the challenges when we face when we're trying to do this? First of all, it's difficult to reproduce. We're not going to get any memory errors doing the happy flow. Again, if I run my application on my computer, on my computer it works. You know that? You've used that saying. It, it, it worked on my computer. So we're not going to get those errors, right? We're going to get them on the large environments. In our case, very large Kubernetes clusters with a lot of resources. We're going to get them um, on edge cases, on things we didn't imagine we'd get and we may not be managing to catch in our unit tests, our system tests, our smoke tests, right? It'll happen unexpectedly. We've got some trade-offs. You want to improve memory? OK, you're, it'll come at the cost of other things, possibly. Uh, so we have to take that into account. When we start writing our code, we'll often go for the simplicity of the code, for the readability of it. Right? We, we're an open source uh, program, a project. We want other people to be able to read our code, understand it easily, contribute. Right? So that'll be one of the first things we're looking for when writing our code. That doesn't mean that code is the most efficient memory-wise. Um, so that's a trade-off. Also, the maintainability of the code, right? These are other trade-offs. Another thing is performance. Um, improving your memory management may improve performance as well, but it also may introduce some other performance uh, problems that we didn't think about. Uh, for example, reducing memory usage by caching data on disk may it may take longer to retrieve that data later, right? So we're introducing a new problem in performance. Another thing is third-party libraries. 
This is code that we haven't written. <laughs> We're choosing to use it, and we may have good reasons for using it. For example, we in Cubescape use OPA in order to run our rules, um, the actual tests that we run to find misconfigurations. So that's great, and we love using it. Um, but we've realized that one of our weak spots was in one of those functions, in the way that we were using it, in the input we were sending to it, in the amount of um, Go routines we were using it in parallel. So we may not be able to let go of these libraries, and we may not be able to change the implementation of these functions, but we can perhaps change the way that we're using it and improve that. So just a quick brief of Golang memory model, because I'm sure many people here are uh, quite familiar. But as we know, we've got a stack heap memory management uh, system, a hybrid uh, stack heap, where uh, on the stack we'd have our local variables, uh, constants, uh, primitive types, anything in the scope of a function. Right? We know that writing to the stack is quite um, fast. Um, on, on the other hand, we've got the heap where we save our dynamic memory allocations. So we've got all the objects we don't know their size uh, at compilation time, pointers, um, slices, maps, um, objects like that. Uh, it would take longer to write to there. And we don't know the life cycle of uh, the objects that are saved to the heap. Right? That depends on how long we're still using them, how long these pointers are in use, for example. Um, and that depends. They will be, that space will be released when the garbage collector gets to it. So the garbage collector is managed by Golang itself. We don't really have a lot that we can uh, do to impact how it works. And maybe we shouldn't, right? even if we do have. It's probably not the best practice. Um, but understanding how it works uh, in the sense that periodically it will scan the memory, check for um, spaces that are not in use anymore, for objects that can be released, um, and does that eventually. So again, understanding how it works can help us um, improve the way that we write our code. So our first tip. Um, one of the first things we do when we start writing a new application is we'll start with the definitions. Right? We'll start with our constants. Our, our structures, our objects. So we'll write a structure of uh, an object that we're going to use throughout our whole program. And we'll probably think of defining it in a way that makes sense, that is logical, that other people will read and understand and say, OK, I get what this means. Um, and the order of the fields will somehow represent maybe the importance of these fields or other, other things you will want to take into account. So I want to introduce here something else. Uh, the order of the field also matters memory-wise. Let's look at this example. This left structure, sorry if I've been <laughs> blocking the way for people, this left structure has four fields, two booleans and two floats. Each boolean will take up one byte in memory, and each float will take up eight. So let's think about how this will be saved in memory once it will, this left structure. So first of all, say we're in a 64-bit architecture. So there we would have uh, our, our smallest unit to, um, to be able to save is an 8-byte unit. So we would um, allocate an 8-byte unit for this first Boolean. And then we'd move on to the next one for the float, look for 8 bytes. And we don't. We only have 7 bytes left. So we'll open up a new unit. And then we'll pad the rest of this first unit. So we're basically wasting a lot of space here, right? That'll, the same thing will happen again right afterwards. That means each of these one bytes will get their own unit where they could have been saved in one. So a better solution, a better way of organizing this in this example is by size. Right? We've got our two floats in the beginning. They each take up one byte, eight bytes, sorry, each uh, one unit of eight bytes. And then we've got our two booleans in one unit. So who's a quick mathematician and can say, how large is this structure? How much space will it take up in memory? 32 bytes, right? We've got four bytes, uh, four units of eight bytes, 32 bytes, and the one on the right, 24. Great mathematicians. Um, so let's look at a representation of this uh, in memory. So like we explained, uh, this first Boolean is taking up a whole unit, and the rest of it is padded. Then we've got another full one, like we said before. So when we're looking at this, we may think, OK, we've saved eight bytes, big deal. But Think about it 
Scalability, think about it in larger structures, with structures with larger fields, with more fields, um, more instances of the same field. In our application, we may have hundreds of these. So we're thinking large, and this one small change may have a big impact. Now, no one's expecting us to sit and count bytes when we uh, define our structures, right? We've got tools that can help us with this. Go has a field alignment fix tool that we can use. We've got a VS Code extension. So just being aware of this can help us be aware when we're writing our structures to find a better, a better way to define them. Size declarations. So like we said, our objects that we don't know their size during compilation time will be saved on the heap. Now, they'll be given some sort of size in the beginning, uh, some initial size that Go will decide upon. And, <clears throat> sorry, and then as we append uh, more objects into it, it'll grow until it has no more room, and then it'll be resized. Right? So we may have already allocated more space after that first space in the heap, and we'll have to remove it to a different place, right? so that first space will be no longer in use. Once the uh, garbage collector, collector will reach it, it'll be um, deallocated. But all that takes time, CPU, garbage collector uh, operations, and space, because we're moving it to a different place. That first space is still in use. Right? That, that whole thing is a lot of management through um, our memory. And what we can do to optimize this is, in some cases, if we know in advance the size that we're going to use, or at least the maximum size we're going to use, it may be worthwhile to initialize it with that size already, taking into account that it may take up a little bit more space until we reach the maximum size. But we won't be allocating and reallocating and resizing our memory. We'll just be using that same space. So this is it depends on the case, right? You may have some cases where you have a maximum size, but throughout your application, it'll just be smaller. So you'll want to make different decisions here. In this case, and in some other cases that I'm going to talk about, there may not be one right answer. And what we can do is use benchmarking. Um, Go has benchmarking uh, <laughs> included in its uh, testing system. And that's a great tool to use to make these decisions in cases that we're not sure uh, what's the better decision. Pointers. Um, did anyone here, apart from me, study computer science in university? I know one of you did, at least. So I don't know what about you guys, but when we learned about pointers, um, one of the first things we were told, always pass by reference, not by value. Right? It's always better to pass by reference. So MythBuster, no, it's not always better. Okay? In Golang, when we use pointer, every time we're using a pointer, we're allocating more space. And the more we keep using that pointer in different parts of our application, that space is still in use. Right? We, can't, uh, we can't free it up. So it's very useful when we need to change things um, in place or when we want to reference the same object. Right? Sometimes there's no avoiding it, and that's fine. But again, in some cases, if we're passing uh, an object to a function. It may be worthwhile to just copy it. If we have a small structure, it may be quicker and less memory consuming to just copy that structure. It'll be copied onto the stack and released from the stack very quickly when we leave that function scope. It might just be less uh, um, memory usage doing it that way. So another thing we can do is use sync pool in order to avoid creating more and more pointers that are unneeded, un unnecessary. Right? We may just use the same ones. And like I've mentioned before, there's no one right answer. We can use benchmarking, and that'll help us make a decision. Uh, quite a specific but important case that we've found um, example is regular expressions. So compiling regular expressions will create an object every time they're compiled. And that will be saved on memory. And this object can be quite large and take up a lot of space, especially if the regular expression is complex. And if we can avoid doing this um, operation more than once, then we should, we should do it just the one time for every regular expression. So if we know that we're trying to match uh, um, another string to this regular expression many, many times throughout our application, the best thing to do if we're using it in a function or in a for loop or something like that is to compile it once, saving it in that object in some sort of local variable or something like that, and then reuse that variable, that object that we've already compiled. That can be 
a big space saver. Again, this might seem like a simple, a small and simple example, but it was a quite, had a, quite a big impact. Smelly loops. <laughs> Let's clear the air. So in this first example, in this first row of the for loop, we're looping over a list of controls, right? This is a real example from Cubescape. Um, we're looping over a slice, and this variable of control, every time, will be pointing to a different control. So the, the data will be different, the object will be different, the, the information inside is different, but the control itself, the variable control, is using the same address because it was initialized in that first row of the for loop. So in that second row, when we're passing um, <clears throat> the control to a separate function, if in that separate function we try to append it onto another slice, we're basically appending the same address again and again. So this caused quite a bit of a problem in our application and some unexpected behavior. Uh, and there are one of two solutions that we could use, either to initialize a new variable inside the loop, which would get its own address, or to use the index, and then we're moving along in the slice and using different indexes. So this isn't improving our memory management per se, um, but it had, uh, again, some quite unexpected uh, behaviors, and this is one of the things we did in our general improvement process, and I thought I would share it. So Go routines. Who uses Go routines? Everyone and anyone? OK, it was like, who uses memory? Um, so we have a lot of challenges when we use Go routines, right? They're great. They're, the, they're basically the Go equivalent of threads. They really help performance. We can run things in parallel. Um, Obviously, we may use them a lot, but we have some challenges. First of all, increased resource usage. So we've got many threads using the same resources at the same time. Obviously, um, that could be a problem. We're using a lot of memory. Every Go routine gets their own stack. Um, and that's basically taking up space that could be used for heap allocation. So when we create many, many Go routines, we may get to a point where we have no more room on the heap to allocate, and we'll reach out of memory. Real cases. <laughs> um, poor synchronization, not exactly memory related, but obviously we need to make sure we're synchronized well when we're using our resources at the same time. Um, memory leaks, if we don't terminate our Go routines well and they keep running, we may reach the point of memory leaks. Has anyone ever tried to debug a Go routine? How did that go? <laughs> it's hard. Right? It's very difficult to, to debug Go routines. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't reach the same behavior every time. And it's difficult to find where the problems actually are. So what we can do in order to find some harmony? Uh, first of all, let's limit the number of Go routines we're using at the same time. So at Cubescape, for example, we had some examples. We had some cases where we were creating Go routines for every node we have in a cluster. Right, so we're going to create a new Go routine for every node. That could be anywhere between one node or, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands, depending on the user's size of, uh, of the cluster. We can't allow ourselves to create an unknown amount, an unlimited amount of Go routines. Right? We're going we're gonna to reach out of memory at some point. So we've got to limit that number of Go routines in some way. There are a few ways to do that. Um, Another thing we need to do is use a timeout or cancellation mechanism, like we said before, to avoid memory leaks. We should use proper synchronizations. We don't want to reach any other synchronization problems, no deadlocks, or et cetera. And this last point is leading me to the next point in general, monitoring and profiling. Um, like we said, first of all, it's difficult to recreate the problems. But then once we've recreated, how do we find where the problem is? How do we find where we need to fix? OK, we've got these Go routines running at the same time. So we got out of memory. Good. OK, we've reproduced. Now how do we pinpoint the point that we need to fix? So we've got some tools to do this. Uh, I've showed, just shown one. It's called pprofiling. And this is built in in Go, pretty easy to use. Um, we've used it quite a lot when we were trying to uh, investigate our problems in Cubescape, and it's proved to be very useful. Um, you can create CPU profiles, uh, traces. We mainly used it for heat profiles to show 
how much memory we were allocating on the heap at every point in time. And it breaks it down into functions by lines, where you can see every function, how much space, it, how much uh, uh, memory it's allocating, and really pinpoint where your problem is, where your weakness is, and where you should put your effort and resources. So just an example from Cubescape is this is before some changes that we made in this function called update results. Um, at this point in time, in this environment, it was taking 33.64 gigabytes. OK, then we made some improvements, some of them like exactly the <laughs> from, from examples that I showed here, we changed some data structures, we changed how we were implementing our um, appends and how we were appending and things like that. And after that, we got 0 0.85 gigabytes. So this was a huge help also in assessing the problem, identifying where we needed to m put our efforts in and resources in order to change and also see the impact. Because even once you've put in the effort and you've changed your code and you think it works well, you want to know that for sure. You want to be able to show it to your team leader. You want to be able to feel safe that you can put this in production on a Friday. <laughs> so I hope this will all be useful to you. And thank you all very much.